Matthew chapter 6. While you're going there, I heard a story this week. There was a ship and it only had a sort of limited number of, um, of passengers on board and the ship was beginning to sink. And uh, so the ship's captain, what are you shaking your head at for? And so, the sh- okay, if, if now this falls flat, it's your fault for interrupting me, all right? So there's a ship, right, and there's a captain. He's only got a few passengers on the ship, and the ship begins to sink. So the captain calls out to the small group of passengers, and he says, does anybody on here know how to pray? And, of course, there's a priest there, and the priest walks forward through the little crowd, puts his hand up and says, yes, sir, I know how to pray. And the captain goes, fantastic, start praying. The rest of you, use life jackets. We're one short. <laughs> that would have been way better had you not... Thank you, thank you, Theo. That was on the way to being spectacular until you started chuckling away at me, Jackie. You... Anyway, we'll talk later. Hey, we've been talking about prayer for the last few weeks. We're going to continue to talk about prayer. Um, can I just say, um, you ever have those mornings where you just kind of feel like all the, the, the ducks are lining up for you? Maybe you go to work and you've got a meeting with somebody and, and maybe you've got to talk to them about something and then a couple of things happen in the lead up that make that process so much easier. You thought maybe it was going to be more difficult or you thought it was going to take a certain... But, but by the time you get to the meeting, you just know that you know that what you're about to say is right because somebody else came and, and gave you it and so on. Ever have those mornings? Just everything lines up. Well, I feel like this, this morning's been like that for me because, uh, Brendan, when you got up and you did your communion talk, I almost thought... We'll just finish on that because I want to talk to us this morning uh, about the will of God. Uh, But I want to talk to us about the will of God in the context of Jesus teaching his disciples how to pray. uh, Luke 11, I think it is. Luke 11 and and Matthew 6 where we are here. Luke 11, uh, Luke records that the disciples ask Jesus the question, teach us how to pray. So then Jesus goes on. He says, well, I'm going to teach you how to pray. And we all know uh, the Lord's Prayer. And so in Matthew chapter 6, verse uh, uh, 9, he says this. He says, in this manner, therefore, pray. And then he begins to teach them how to pray. Um, Any sports coaches here? Anyone coach sporting teams or have in the past yet? So uh, here's what I do. I I, I still coach um, um, sporting teams. I'll run off after church today to Ballina. I've got a couple of teams I've got to coach down there for some state uh, titles we've got coming up. But what I do as a coach is I've got this big picture. Let's I've got a move or a play or a set piece that we want to do. And it goes like this. And there's probably uh, uh, several things involved in achieving that one sort of end. And so what I do is I like to break down my set piece into bite-sized chunks. And then I, I, I teach the bite-sized chunks. And then what we do at the end, we put all the chunks together and we have the play. But by breaking it down, I'm trying to get people to focus on individual parts and their individual roles in certain parts of that play. And I think that when Jesus is teaching them about prayer, that's the picture I get here. He's, t- he's going, right here, you want to learn how to pray. Well, let me break it down into some little sort of bite-sized chunks for you so that you can get a bit of an understanding of what prayer is and, and to get you on a path or a course to at least begin to engage in this thing we call prayer. And so Jesus is breaking this down into little bits and pieces. And, and the first thing that he wants to establish for us, as we talked about last week, is he wants to get our eyes off ourselves. And make sure that when we come to prayer, that our gaze is firmly and strongly fixed upon him. And so he starts in Matthew 6, 9 by saying, In this manner pray, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. We talked about this last week. God wants us to understand that we're coming to a Father. We're coming to a loving Father, a good Father. And I know, again, when I say that word Father, conjures up images for some of us. But I believe that God wants us to get through some of that stuff, the hurts, the disappointments, the wrong images that we have. I remember one day getting this realization myself that I've always, I look at my earthly father as, as the uh, authentic image of a father. And then somehow I've got to work out God. But one day it dawned on me that the, the, the perfect image of a father is actually God, not any earthly father. My, my earthly father fell short in many areas, though he's a wonderful, wonderful man. I myself fall short in many areas, though I'm a wonderful, wonderful man. <laughs> but I'm not a perfect father. But, but what I encourage my children in the areas where I fall short and so on, I, I, I hope my children understand, don't, don't look at God that way because of my human weakness. God is a perfect father. And when we come to prayer, we're coming 
to a father who cares, who protects, who provides, who loves us, who's for us, uh, who at times has to discipline us, but never disciplines us out of his own anger or frustration, as some of our earthly fathers may have. He disciplines us because he's able to sit back and go, this discipline is what's best for you. This is what you need right now to bring the best outcome into your particular world. So he starts off by saying, uh, in this manner pray, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. And then in verse 10, he says this, your kingdom come, your will be done. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth. On earth. Not just, see, God's will is not just some ethereal concept out there in the cosmos. God's will is something tangible and practical that is able to be revealed and seen and evidenced right here in this natural plane where we live. I, I, I hear sometimes people talk about the will of God as if it's some thing out there. But the will of God, according to what I read in these ancient documents, is a tangible, practical reality and something that gets done. And, and something that, that when Jesus taught them to pray, he said, we're praying to a father. And, and what I want you to, to, first of all, is get your focus right. Your focus is on God. But then I want you to understand, while the focus of prayer is the face of God, the, the, the object of prayer is the will of God. So the focus of prayer is the face of God. We're looking to God. But the direction or the, 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 the purpose of prayer is, is something to be used to bring about down here on earth this thing called the will of God, the desire of God, the pleasure of God. Because how many of you know, how many of you know in the beginning God created the world? Are we all on, on that page? Maybe some people here don't believe that. But I do believe that as revealed in these ancient writings that God created the world. And God put Adam and Eve down here. He created humanity, and uh, he put them there. But he didn't just put them there and go, there you are, and walk away. Do whatever you want. It's up to you now. I've given you dominion and authority. You do whatever you want. No, no, he still gave them instruction, didn't he? There's still a way. You have authority, dominion, power, but there's still a way to live down here. And the way God wants me to live down here is literally as if I'm living what I'm going to live in heaven, but I'm living it down here on earth. God's will in heaven, how's that going to benefit anybody? When we get there, of course it's going to be God's will in heaven. People that aren't doing God's will won't be there. But God's will being outworked here on earth is something that needs to take place so that the world can see, hey, there is an alternative to the hopelessness. There is an alternative to the selfishness. There is an alternative to the emptiness. There is an alternative to the culture that we see being pushed and pushed upon us. And that culture is the culture of God's will here on earth. It's the culture of the church. And so Jesus teaches them, he says, that the focus of prayer is the face of God, but the subject of prayer, at its very base level, the subject of prayer is the will of God. Father, what do you want? God, what do you want to take place down here? What do you want in, in this situation or this circumstance? Now, Matthew chapter 7, verse 11, Jesus says this. He says, if you then being evil... Speaking of, he's speaking to them about asking, asking for things. He says, if you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, then how much more will your Father who's in heaven give good things to those who ask, right? So, so what he's saying there is you ask for things, and if you ask for good things, then I'm going to give you good things, right? So the good things that you're asking for, I want to give them to you. Uh, in James 1.17, it says, Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights with whom there's no variation or shadow of turning. In other words, God's got no hidden agenda. God's not trying to manipulate you. God's not trying to use you. God literally has the best intentions for you that you will find this side of heaven itself. Nobody has purer motivations for your life, better intentions for your life, opportunities for more fulfillment and joy for your life. Nobody can beat God and what God has to offer you down here, this side of heaven. So Jesus says, here's how I want you to pray. I want you to pray, uh, uh, your will be done down here. And what he's saying here is that God's will is good and God's will is perfect. And if you are praying in line with God's will, and if you, you are the type of person that's committed to not only 
seeing the will of God, but living the will of God. As Brendan so beautifully put, living out the will of God down here on earth, the will of God for your life is only going to bring good things and perfect things into your world. God's intentions for you are good. Sometimes we, sometimes we, we buy the... I, I, I'm careful how I say this. Sometimes we buy the overly pious lie that God wants to rip you off. That when Jesus said to his followers, unless you deny yourself, take up your cross and follow me, you cannot be my disciple. We read that and go, Jesus, what you're really trying to do is you're trying to take away all the fun, fulfillment and joy out of my life and make me some kind of monk in a monastery that can't talk to people for years. That's the only way to please you, God. We don't understand. God never takes anything from us that he doesn't want to replace with something better. Because that's the nature of God. Whatever he asks us to lay down in our life, he always does it because he has pure motivations and he knows that if you lay that thing down, the trade-off is going to be way, way better in your favor. How many of you look at, how many of you trade online and you're looking at, okay, if I invest this, I'll get back that kind of a return. And sometimes you get it right and you might think you're the greatest. Per- and then sometimes anyone have a bad deal? Anybody ever done? Yep, Owen Allsop, good on you, brother. Owen's done some bad, terrible deals in his life. You thought that you were going to get, but you didn't, and you did some bad deals. I know you're not the only one that's done bad deals, but thank you for being honest. Well, here's the thing. You cannot get a bad deal with God. You just can't get a bad deal with God. The odds are so incredibly stacked in your favor, and you have all this insider information at your fingertips. When you lay something down, give something over, surrender your will, and allow God's will to come, you always win. Always win. But it's amazing how many of us will hang on to things that aren't the will of God, lifestyle choices, habits, Hurts, bitterness, resentment. Because somewhere in the mix, we feel like if we let go of them, what will life look like? How can I let go of that? It'll cost me too much to let go of that. If I forgive that person, that will cost me too much humility. Too much of my pride's at stake here, and so I won't... uh, But God's there going, it doesn't matter what you give up. I'm going to bring into your life that which is good And perfect. God's will always wins. And he's teaching his disciples here, going, the the, the focus of prayer is the face of God, but the object of your prayer is the will of God. Because the will of God is that which is perfect for your life, and perfect for your community, and perfect for your world. If God really only gives us that which is good and perfect, then why do we still not want to submit to his will? Why do so many of us still fight against the will of God? Why do so many of us still look at what Jesus taught and go, yeah, well, that was great for them, but you don't know my situation, God. You don't know my circumstance, God. That might have been all right for a culture 2,000 years ago where they didn't have the internet, but it's so much tougher now, Lord. It's so much harder now. Why is it that we still struggle to submit to his will, still struggle to surrender fully to him, when his will is nothing but good. One of the great things about your children getting older, and some of you may relate to this, and I've banged on about this a few times in the last few weeks, and I'm going to continue to bang on about it because it's just such a great feeling. That moment when your children get older, you know when they're young and they've got that chemical thing, it's, got, it's scientific, it's a chemical. It hits them at about, I don't know, 12, and goes through for a number of years, and you're, you're obviously devoid of it. Doesn't, it didn't happen to you. You're, you're, you're perfect. I prayed for you guys. I mean, your mother prayed for you, it didn't happen. But they get this chemical, and they wake up one day, and they just sit up in bed, and they go, oh, my goodness, I know everything (laughs) about everything. And then they can't wait to come and tell you, mum and dad, about that. Anyone experience that? They just can't wait to tell you. They know. Don't get angry at them. Don't get mad at them. It's not their fault. It's a chemical thing. It's science. They know everything about him. And then when you sort of get to your, you know, maybe your, your early, late 20s, early 30s, I reckon, is when it really begins to run out. That chemical, well, by the time I got to around 30, that chemical had disappeared to the point where I woke up one day and went, I know nothing about nothing. <laughs> Complete change. 
But you go through this period. But you know what? There comes this point where they start to come to you, sometimes on the quiet, like a little bit like Nicodemus at night when he came to Jesus, you know? Tell me this born again thing. They'll pull, they'll pull themselves away from their siblings and they'll go, you know what, Dad? And I love these words. You were fright. And I just dropped to my knees in praise and worship of our Creator. And I, I want to, come here, son, let's get a selfie together. And, you know, can you say that again? I'm going to hit the record button because nobody's going to believe you said that to me. Nobody. Come on, let's. And they won't repeat it. It just slipped out and then they boop, bring it back. But I get that more and more now with my children as they get a bit older. They'll, they'll actually confess and say, Dad, you know what? You were actually right. You were actually right. There's this song by a guy called Brad Paisley. Anyone know Brad Paisley, country singer? Yeah, I'm a bit of a Brad. Yeah, I knew, I knew that um, country bent up the backward. Um, Brad Paisley's got this song, and in this song, he writes a letter to himself. He's, an, he's in his 30s, and he writes a letter, and the song's called Letter to Me. And he writes a letter back to himself when he was a little kid. And it's actually quite a beautiful song. He's basically saying to his younger self, don't stress the, the things in life as much. I know how you feel in the moment, but life's not going to end. Life's going to turn out pretty good for you. You're married now. You've got a beautiful family. Life's doing good. You know, And all those moments where we grew up and we thought that was the end of it. You ever have those moments when you were younger? You just thought that was the end of my life, that broken relationship, or didn't get into uni, or didn't make the friend, or didn't make the sports thing, whatever. And he's just encouraging himself. But there's a line in there, and I love this line. It says, uh, it, it, it says uh, where is it? He says, each and every time you have a fight, just assume you're wrong and dad is right. (laughs) And every time it comes on, I just, my hand finds the volume and that line just goes up in the car. And maybe it worked because now they're starting to come to me and say, dad, you know what? You were actually right about a couple of things. You weren't as dumb as I thought you were my entire juvenile life. (laughs) What if we all had that attitude about God? What what if every time we looked at his will, his purposes, his plans, what if we all just assumed I'm wrong and he's right? What if we just made that assumption? God knows a couple of things more than you do. He's got a couple of angles he's looking at this circumstance from more than your vision's allowing you to see right now. He's, he's, He's actually outworking a way better end than the good end you think you're working for. Because that's the very nature of being a loving father and that's the very nature of being God. You know, our our spiritual formation is very much like our natural formation, isn't it? You know, when I I, I first got saved and I came to faith, my prayer life really was just all about, okay, God, I want this and I want that and can you give me that and can you give me this, God, and I need this and I want that. It was just all very much, God, now that I've got you, now that you've saved me, that's awesome. Now sit back and listen to me. I'll teach you a few things. God, this is how life works, God. Thanks for saving me, but I'm just going to show you how life works in my world, you know? And God is so loving and gracious, isn't he? He just, I mean, I was so blessed in my early days with God that, that the prayers that he would answer. I remember being on uh, the YWAM base. I got saved at 19, joined Youth of the Mission uh, six months later. And I remember being there, and I ended up with this reputation. Anybody on the base that needed an answer to prayer, they would literally say, any students on training schools, the staff, the married couples, let's go find Alan. This, and I'm not making this up. They would say, let's go find Alan, because when he prays, things happen. And I don't know why that happened. It was like God, my father, just chuckled away and said, look, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll humor you for a while. You know? And all these prayers were getting answered and everything. But, but then kind of as, as, as time goes on, you, you, you begin to realize that, um, you know what, I, I don't know as much as I thought I knew God. So instead of me telling you what's best, how about I give you some space to tell me what might be best? How about I create some space in my prayer time now, instead of just rattling off my grocery list to you, how about I create a little bit of space where maybe you can download to me What is it that you think should happen in this situation? What is it that you think I truly need? How is it that you think I should handle this moment right here? But you see, I'll never do that if I don't learn to trust God. I will never surrender my will completely to God if I don't trust him. And neither will you. If you don't fully trust that God's will on heaven and on earth as it is in heaven, if you don't truly believe that God's will is good and perfect, if you don't truly believe that God knows a bit more than you do, 
you don't truly believe that God's got your best interests at heart, if you don't truly believe that God sees a big picture and he, 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 he plops us here and there and he wants to take us, our gifts, our talents, our, our being and, and, and use us in different ways, in different ways, if we don't actually believe and trust that God uh, sees us like that and that God has good things for us, then the truth is we'll never truly surrender ourselves to his will because we'll feel like he either doesn't know as much as we do or he's just blatantly going to rip me off. I've never, ever been ripped off by God. You'll never be able to truly pray God's will until you're prepared to accept God's will. You'll never truly be a person, as Jesus taught the disciples, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth. He's teaching them, I want you to pray like this. This is, if you want me to teach you how to pray, then I'm going to give you a little bit of meat here about prayer. This is what Jesus is saying to them, and, and here's what it is. Prayer is, a, is an opportunity for us to co-create or co-work with God to bring about his will down here on earth, whether it be in your personal life, whether it be in your community, for your family, for that situation at work, for your finances. It's an opportunity for us to co-create with God to see his will come about down here. But you'll never truly pray God's will if you're not prepared to actually accept God's will for your life. Sometimes I think prayer has this image of just being something we do, but prayer is intricately linked to who we actually are. It's really about who we are. The real power in prayer is the direction it's traveling in, and the direction it travels in is his will. The real power is the direction it travels in, not the fancy words we use, not the length of time we take to get to the point, not the number of scripture references we use, not the tone of our voice when we come before the Lord. You ever meet those people? They completely transform into some other person when they pray. I'm talking to you like this, and then when I come before the Lord, oh, my Lord, my Lord. They change their tone. They change their voice. It's like, you know what? That God was watching you before you started praying. Just be yourself. Take the masks off. Be authentic. Be real. Be real. But be the kind of person that's surrendered to the will of God. You can't pray. You won't truly ever pray your will be done on earth as it is in heaven unless you're prepared to accept the will of God on earth as it is in heaven. And so many people aren't. Ouch, somebody said. How much of our prayer lives are centered around what God wants as opposed to what we want? Now, there's nothing wrong, by the way, with praying what you want. There's absolutely nothing wrong with that. But for most people, pretty much our whole prayer life is what we want, with very little consideration about perhaps what God might want. And again, this is what Jesus is trying to teach his disciples. Pray to your Father, but before you start to talk about your own needs, resisting temptation, before you get onto anything that's you focused, and that's the Lord's Prayer. The first, couple of, the first two points are, are focused away from you. Look at God, pray for his will, then you can turn around, and now you look at yourself for the rest of the Lord's Prayer. But there's no point looking straight at yourself. Too many people look straight at themselves the minute they start praying. We sit down, and the minute we start praying, all we're thinking about is ourself. All we're looking at is ourself. And, our, and when, by the way, when I say we're looking at ourself, we're looking at our own very limited interpretation of whatever it is we think we need, whatever it is we think needs to happen, whatever it is we think would solve the problem. We're limiting ourselves to our own understanding and not relying on or surrendering ourselves to the understanding of a God who knows all things, encompasses all things, is over all things, through all things, more pure than you are, better than you are, wiser than you are, greater than you are, and way more powerful than you are. If you don't trust him, though, I understand why people don't do it. Now, is there anything wrong with asking for what you want? No, there's not. The greatest example of a prayer in the New Testament is, of course, Jesus himself. And here's how Jesus prayed, and Brendan pointed it already out to us this morning. Matthew 26, 39, he went a little further, and he fell on his face. This is Jesus in Gethsemane. And he prayed, saying, Oh, my Father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Luke records it this way, Luke twenty two forty two. 42. He says, Father, if it's your will, take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Is it okay for you to go and tell God what you want? Of course it is. Jesus himself did it. He sat down. He said, Lord, here's the deal. This is not going to feel good. It's not going to be nice. And, and, and there's nothing really within me that desires the feeling, the emotion, the rejection, the hurt, everything that's about to happen. But at the end of the day, it's not about what I want, God. You're wiser. You know the bigger picture. And if this is what has to happen, I'm going to surrender myself to your will. So there's nothing wrong with going to God and saying, this is my will. This is what I'd like. But are we doing it with a demanding finger pointed at God, this is what I will have? 
or are we laying it down and at the end of it, it's very much, okay, God, I presented to you what I want to present to you, but overriding all of that is your will be done in these situations and circumstances, Father. Your will be done. I remember uh, I, I used to pray. I used to get really uh, up in God's face, so to speak. I, I, I've always had a prayer life that was fairly real with God. And I remember I used to uh, sit at, at this, uh, in, in this little place I had and I'd look out my window and I would get right up in God's grill and get frustrated with God for all the dumb things he did that day. It wasn't God, it was people. But God, you allowed them and you made them, so it's your fault. And I'd just tell God, this sucks, God, and I hate this and blah, blah. And I would just rattle off and get it all out of my system. But I would always end it by saying, but you know what, God, at the end of the day, I know that you're good. End of the day, God, I trust you. I know that you know way more than I do. And what I really want is I, I, want, I want what you want. Because in the beginning, I gave my life to Jesus, and so did you. Is that right? You gave your life to him. You didn't just give your financial security to him. You, you didn't just decide that you were going to give to him your physical health, keep everything else back. You didn't just decide to give him your relationships. When we enter into following Jesus, Jesus said, hey, you've got to give me your life, your whole life, which means that I want my will, I want you to be the kind of person that accepts my will in all the areas of your life. See, the will of God is something that's real, it's done, it's achieved. In, in, in the long run, it's something that's evident. People can see the will of God being outworked in our world. See, Jesus was prepared not to get his own way because he trusted that God knew better. And how many of us pray like that? I'm prepared to not get my own way in prayer because my, my, I'm, I'm submitted to the will of God. See, the will of God must be a posture of your life before it ever becomes a prayer on your lips. It's got to be a posture of our life that, Lord, I'm submitted to your will, come what may. And God, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you how I feel and I'm going to pray. But at the end of the day, Lord, what I really want is the will of God to come to pass on earth in my life as it is in heaven. That, that means there's a commitment too, by the way, to me down here on earth to daily living the will of God. When, when people talk about the will of God, sometimes as, as, as Christians, we think about your vocation. What do you do? That's the will of God. No, no, no. You know what the will of God is? It's the very next thought you have in your head. That's the will of God. It's the very next conversation you have with a person. That's the will of God. What are you going to do in that? Will of God, will of self, will of something else? It's, it's, it's the at, very next attitude you decide to let fester. It's, it's the very next thing you do. It's, it, the will of God is very much about the actions, the intentions, the thoughts. It's the way we live our life here on earth. Every day, regardless of where I am physically or vocationally, every decision I make is a choice to make it within the bounds of the will of God or to go, no, no, my will be done, Lord, not yours. I'm just going to rip into this person. I'm not, not going to give grace. I'm not going to show them love. God, I'm not going to be merciful. God, I'm not going to forgive. I'm going to hang on to that, Lord. God, I'm not going to be generous. Lord, I'm not going to any of those things. I'm going to make that choice. The will of God is not just vocational. It's every step of our day. We make a choice to surrender to the will of God, and it doesn't always feel easy. Just like Jesus, he did not want to go through the pain and the suffering he went through on the cross, but he realized that he was submitted to a higher authority. He submitted himself to God. And history is called history for a reason. It's his story. And it goes from over here all the way to there, and we are just a little blip on the radar of that history. But while I'm down here, I want to submit myself to an outwork and live and be an example to the world around me. This is what the will of God looks like knowing that it's always going to be good because I'll never get ripped off by God. I never trade. I never lose out on that trade with God. John 6 verse 38, Jesus actually said this. He said, I've come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. See, the, 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 the power, the attraction of Jesus. He was a man that came down here and understood while I'm here on earth, it's not about my will. I'm going to enjoy this journey. And there's going to be some great things on the way. But at the end of the day, I'm not just living for my will. He said, I've come down here. It's not about my will. It's about the will of God. It's about living life down here as a representative of a kingdom greater than myself. And that's who Jesus was. He came down to do the will of his Father. I wonder, uh, in your life and my life, what, whose will are we really that worried about? Who, whose will are we living for? Whose will are we doing? When you go to school on Monday, whose will are you going to be doing? And it's not going to school that's the will. It's what you do while you're there. That's the will. What, whose will are you going to outwork while you're there? When you go to work, 
when we go home with our wives and our husbands, how are we going to treat each other? Are we going to treat each other as the will of God would have us treat them? Or are we just going to treat them the way we feel in the moment? Our children, how are we going to do it? See, prayer is not so much about what I'm presenting to God, but it's way more about who I'm presenting to God. The person I'm presenting to God, a person submitted to and praying for and wanting to serve and come under the will of God as in heaven down here on earth. Who are we? A person submitted to the will of God, a person living the will of God, a person focused on the will of God. That's almost foul language these days, by the way, to suggest that we should submit ourselves to an authority. Uh, Hasn't COVID revealed that to us? The amount of stuff that I've seen online where people are ripping into the government and ripping into this. And I don't want to get on a rant about it, but, uh, you know, go and read in Timothy, where Paul wrote to them in Timothy, and he said, you know what? Pray for your leaders. Pray for those in authority. Lift them up. Uh, You know, and and please don't tell me that wearing a mask and having a few restrictions here, we're going through a hell of a lot more than what they did back then when he said that to them. They weren't treated very popularly by their government either. Pray for it. It's almost, a, it's almost a mark of, of maturity these days to, to join the rebellious group and be against everything. And, and you know, it might start over here, but it outworks itself all over the world. I'm rebellious against any type of authority figure. Yet as believers, you know what? We live a life submitted to an authority figure. That's what we do. It's the choice that we've made. It's the choice I've made. I've chosen to live under this, the authority of God. And I've chosen also to live under the authority of everything that he had to say. It's my choice, and I'll, I'll, live, I'll handle the consequences. I'll make the choice. I'll handle the consequences. But as, 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 as the church, we're, we're countercultural. We're countercultural, and we've got to understand that. Submission is not a dirty word. It's not a dirty word. Daniel, do you want to jump back up for me, mate? I'm going to finish up. The degree to which we trust God is the degree to which we'll be willing to accept his will for our life. If we don't trust him, we're not going to accept his will. And if we're not going to accept his will, we're not going to be the people that can pray with authority his will. Who are we today? Who are you? Are you prepared to accept the will of God in your life? Are there areas in your world right now where you're not praying for the will of God, you're just demanding, telling God what he has to do. You're not open to hearing from God. It's like Paul going to the Lord and saying, you know, I had this thorn in my side and I petitioned the Lord three times, take it away. But God spoke to him in the midst of that and said, it's not my will to take it away. I don't get it. Don't shoot the messenger. He said, rejoice in it. My grace is sufficient. Paul came out of that and said, you know what? Now I'm going to boast in this thing. Why? Because I'm confident that whatever's going on in my world right now, I'm confident God's all over it. And for whatever reason and purpose, and I don't get it, but God knows and God says, he's with me. His grace is sufficient in this situation. Sometimes, don't we as believers, we've got our cookie cutter answers to every single prayer. We pray this and that should happen. Pray that and that has to happen. I've got four children. Let me tell you something. I've treated my four children differently. I have. Have I treated them fairly? Yes. Have they had the same opportunities? Yes. But they're different. And their circumstances are different. And somebody can handle something a bit more than one of the others can. And one of them would never have, 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 that opportunity would not have been a benefit to them. It would have hurt more, but this one over here, it does. They're individual people. Situations are are individual and different. And it's not some cookie cutter, one size fits all solution to every problem in life. Why is it that I've prayed for people that have been sick and God has miraculously right there before my very eyes healed them. I've seen them jump up out of beds I've been in for years. But then I've prayed for other people and they've gone on and died. Why is that? I don't know. Don't know. Why does a man like Keith Green, one of the great heroes of the faith, I love Keith Green, I love his music. Why is it that Keith Green gets in a plane and dies at 33 and... I know there's a few practical reasons for that, but look at what's happened. I I don't get it all. I don't understand it all. Why did God just not keep the plane in the air because he was doing such a great job? I don't know. I don't know. So I'm either going to do my head in, trying to work everything out, or I'm just going to come to a place where I go, you know what, God, I don't need to do my head in. I just need to keep my focus right. God, you're a good God. Father, you're there. See, I believe to the degree that we actually tr- learn to trust God and his will for our life, that's the degree to which you actually experience this thing called the Christian life. 
Too many people don't experience Christianity for what it really is because they feel like it's a foot in here and a foot in there. And God sits there and goes, I can't do anything with half a person. Genuinely, I just can't do anything with half a person. But if you give me everything, and you abandon yourself to me as the early church did, as the early disciples did. He said, you know what? I will take you on a journey. You will begin to experience the stuff you read. You'll know what real joy is. You won't constantly be going, well, this isn't working. I'm not joyful. Make the step. Get a foot out of the other camp. Put them both on the same side of the fence. Make the decision. As much as it's hard, I'm going to do the, by, by the power of the Holy Spirit, I'm going to live the way God wants me to live. I'm going to lay aside my pride, my ambitions. I'm going to lay aside my perspectives. I'm going to surrender everything and give it all over to Jesus. That's a choice you have to make. It's not something God will ever force upon you. But it was so important to Jesus and so pivotal to prayer that he made sure it was a part of his teaching when he sat his disciples down and said, you really want to learn how to pray? Okay, then I'll show you how to pray. Get your focus right. And then understand what the purpose of prayer truly is. At its, at its baseline, it's about bringing the will of God to play down here on earth. Well, I took my um, uh, middle son to the Solomon Islands some years ago uh, on a missions trip. We went there a, a while back. And there's this place on the island of Malaita, and we go up across the Malaita, and we go up this big mountain to the top of the hill. There's a Bible college up there. And uh, we go up there, and we do some teaching up there, and... Uh, then in the evenings, the, the guy that runs the Bible college, lovely Papua New Guinean guy, he would take us walking through bush tracks and everything to these villages in the middle of nowhere. And the team I'd take over, they'd be preaching and doing dramas and teaching and stuff. Wonderful time. And we had this one day off. And so I knew uh, from previous trips about this little uh, uh, water hole we could go and swim. So I said to the team, who wants to go? And they all said, yep. And I had my, my middle son, Jordan, with me. It was, it was a fantastic trip having him with me. Uh, I remember one time we, we jumped in the back of a ute and we took off in a ute to drive somewhere and Jordan fell out of the ute. And I didn't even notice till we're down the road. Somebody else, hey, where's Jordan? I don't know. Oh, he's way back there. He still remembers it though. Good memory according to him. <laughs> but we got down to the swimming hole and we're standing uh, on the top of this big rock and you jump off over this, there's this waterfall and you jump off it into this crystal clear, most beautiful water surrounded by all these big palms and trees. It's just in the middle of nowhere. No technology, nothing, just beautiful. You're like Indiana Jones, sort of climbing over and slashing through things just to get there. Took about 45 minutes downhill to get there. It takes you about an hour, 20, hour and a half to get back up. But we get there, we're jumping in. And underneath where this big rock is, there's this hidden cave. And a few trips earlier, the little island boys showed me this hidden cave. And what you've got to do is you can't see it. Nobody knows it's there. But you've got to go under the water I remember the first time I did it, one of the little boys said, come, I'll take you. And I was freaking out because I, I, I'm allergic to drowning. So I, I didn't want to do it. But this little boy saying, trust me, trust me, hold my hand, come under and just trust me. And he swam under and under, further and further under. And I'm just thinking, I've got to let go of his hand. I've got to pull out of this because this is not going to be good. But thankfully I didn't. And then he gets to this certain point and he pops up and he pulls me up and I lift my head and we're in this underwater big cavern, big cave with this little ledge you can climb up on the ledge and get completely out of the water. Tiny little rays of sunlight through rock cracks in the rock. It was just the most amazing place. And every time we would go to that swimming hole, I made it a habit of just swimming in there by myself because it was so peaceful. And I'd just get under there in this cool water and just have my head up and just think, God, thank you for letting me have experiences like this. Lord, this is awesome, you know. And I remember when my son came and I said to him, hey, Jordan, do you want to go under the cave? And he was panicking. I said, it's okay, Jordan. I said the same thing. I put my hand out. I said, Jordan, just grab my hand. Trust me. And thankfully he did. And we swam under and he told me later on, Dad, I was freaking out. I said, man, I get it because I was freaking out too. I was freaking out too. You know what? That's faith. That's abandoning yourself to the will of God. I want you to imagine right now you're swimming in that pool and God's putting his hand out and he's saying, I want to take you somewhere. And where we're going to land is way, way, it's just amazing. It really is. It really is amazing. But you're going to have to take my hand, come underwater and let me pull you along. But trust me, it's going to be worth it. But you've got to make the choice. You can stay out there because you're afraid. You stay out there because you just want to play around with everybody else. Or you can take the dive. 
I want to encourage you this morning, if you've never fully surrendered your life to God, I'm not talking about being a Christian. It's one thing to say, yeah, I pray to prayer, I come to church, I, I, I do all the Christian things, I go to youth. That's one thing. It's not about that. It's about actually surrendering control of your life. Going, God, I'm, I'm going to live for you. Even if I don't get it. But it's what I'm going to do. And it's a choice only you can make. But I want to encourage you this morning. Do what Jordan did. Do what I did. Accept God's hand and let him take you under and let him bring you to that place because it's worth it. That's real Christianity, people. Father, thank you for this morning, Lord. I just pray for each person that's here, God. And Lord, I, I, I want to pray specifically, God, those people that are here that have never fully surrendered. God, maybe they've given 95%, but they still haven't given 100. There's still areas of their world where they're just deciding to do it their own way, where they're hanging on to. God, areas where they don't trust you or they just don't want to. Father, I pray for those people this morning, Lord. God, would you break into their world? Would you show them that you've never ripped anybody off? Would you show them that you have something waiting for them that is so much better than anything this world can offer or anything they can conjure up in their own efforts? Holy Spirit, just speak to those people and work in their hearts. And Father, I pray for the rest of us, God. We would just continue to surrender ourselves to you, Lord. We would, God, ask the question, what's your will? How do we live it out? How do we pray? Your will be done in our lives this morning, right here on earth as it would be in heaven, Father. And God, as we leave this place today, I pray for each person here, God, each person here that follows you. Lord, in the next seven days, would you give us an opportunity to tell somebody about Jesus? Give us an opportunity to tell somebody about the goodness of God that doesn't right now understand that or doesn't know it. And we ask for that opportunity, Father, together in Jesus' name. Everybody said... Amen. Amen. We are done. Tea and coffee next door. But can I encourage you again, if the Spirit of God is speaking to you, would you please grab somebody? Don't walk out of here and let that seed get taken away by the cares and worries of life. Grab somebody. Ask them, would you pray for me? Maybe share with them, whatever. That's, that's maturity. That's discipleship. That's doing life with Jesus together. It's not about standing here hearing a message. It's doing it together. So can I encourage you? Don't leave without grabbing someone, praying for someone, doing the work of discipleship with one another. Amen? Some people are looking at me like that's strange. It's not strange. It's what these guys did. It's what got the church to be the powerful movement it was.